Hey, good morning everybody and welcome to the vlog. How are you guys faring out there? I hope it's going well. I hope that you're staying safe out there and let's just get distracted for a little while with a great day together if you don't mind. I have an idea, but uh, I'm going to have to start this idea with uh, my girl Sunrise. And I thought about this idea of saying uh, good pet, bad pet, you know, and I don't know if you guys like the idea. I could do other animals. I'm going to go ahead and start with Burmese pythons. That's right. I'm going to start with Burmese pythons. Are they good pets or are they bad pets? And we'll kind of go through a little of the pros and cons with them. And again, if you guys like it, let me know down in the comments if you guys want me to do another good pet, bad pet species. Let me know what it is or if you think you don't want to. I don't know. But anyways, Burmese pythons have been so special to me. Everyone knows that my first pet snake ever when I was 15 years old was actually a Burmese python. Now, I've said a lot of times I think that that was a mistake. So let's just break down what makes Burmese pythons so amazing because honestly, since I've been 15, I've never went one minute of my life without a Burmese python. So obviously, they got to be pretty amazing animals, right? Now, they are a big snake. There is no doubt about that. There's no doubt about it. But if you want a big snake, uh, retics can sometimes be a handful. I love reticulated pythons. They're maybe one of my favorite big snakes. Well, I love anacondas. I love Bur uh, Regardless, they are definitely amazing. But Burmese pythons are kind of the puppy dog of the big snake world. Of course, this is Marshmallow, the ivory Burmese python. Now, this is a super version of the hypo gene, sometimes called the fire gene and stuff like that. It's basically a leucistic, right? Almost the same thing happens with ball pythons. And by the way, he is in the ugliest stage he's ever going to be because he's just starting to break his shed. Uh, looks horrible. It's going to look beautiful tomorrow when it sheds out 100%. But one of the things that is a kind of pro for Burmese pythons is that unlike retics, they don't typically climb a whole lot. These guys spend most of their life on the ground. We know retics love to climb, so you really should have a kind of tall cave. When it comes to berms, you know, you still want to give them the opportunity to climb, absolutely, but they don't need that big, tall cage to climb to keep that mental stimulation going, right? So uh, that's actually a plus, is that oftentimes you need more surface area and not as much height, uh, which is always nice, because when you start talking about a four or five or six foot high cage, that takes up a lot of real estate. Anyone that watches the vlogs knows that this is Jeffrey, the hypo granite Burmese python. And it's a ferocious feeder. That's one of the things I love about Burmese pythons is they're not picky at all. I mean, they eat and they eat pretty much anything you want to feed them. There's no doubt about it. And as you can see, they come in some amazing color palettes, right? I mean, obviously a hypo granite is one of my favorites, but even an albino like Sunrise is beautiful. And when Marshmallow sheds, he's absolutely adorable. And there's tons of them. And the truth is, is that they're relatively inexpensive, most of them. I mean, there's a few that get a little bit pricey, but they're not out of most people's price range. So the fact that you can get some beautiful animals in all kinds of different colors and the fact that they don't get picky like say a ball python because a lot of people that keep snakes are a little bit stressed out when their snake doesn't eat and I understand that berms the only time they don't eat is when they're deep in shed and to be honest with you oftentimes they'll even eat in shed because these guys are just little garbage disposal and like I mentioned we want to continue to stay distracted in these crazy times of isolation and social distancing and stuff like that there's actually a Netflix show that I'm going to start watching called Tiger King. Uh, I've heard mixed reviews about it. I actually know some people that it's about or in it. I'm not even sure if they're in it, but I know it's about them. So I'm going to start that tonight. You guys gave us a bunch of really great options uh, in Netflix and Hulu and all the other stuff. So in the comments, let me know if you've watched Tiger King and if you're going to or what else we can watch so we can continue to share like uh, how we spend our days when we have all this extra time not working or whatever. Again, I'm still working hard, but I'll be honest, I still do have have a couple hours extra a day that I'm not used to ever watching TV. I just don't do it. Uh, and uh, I'm trying to learn because it's been hard for me to concentrate on it, but hopefully uh, I'll start the series and I'll report back to you guys. Oh, and guess who's back? Yo, Jay is I'm not back. dead. He's not dead. Thank God uh, it was not a more serious sickness. He took a couple days off, got over his sickness. He I feel better great. than ever. I need to get yeah. sick more often. <laughs> yeah, well, let's not, I don't want anyone to get sick. Just Everyone play. here is healthy and happy, thankfully. For sure. uh, again, people are working as much as they want. Uh, some of the crew is here a lot. Some of the crew is taking the time to kind of relax a little bit. Jessica and Bruce are taking a much needed day off, That's for but sure. they're here every day. Andrea is going to be back here tomorrow. So uh, everyone is doing well here. Just want to keep you guys updated. And we are all wishing you the very best health and uh, we can get through this together, guys. That's right. Oh my God, guys, check this out. Oh my gosh. Cannot wait to see this snake. The Amazon Basin just shed a perfect shed too. 
look at that shed and look at how absolutely stunning that snake is. Oh my gosh. Of course, this one uh, came from Kevin over at Nerd and it hasn't fed yet, but of course I knew it was going opaque. So now that it's shed out, I'll go ahead and offer it food tomorrow and hopefully this sucker will eat, but she looks stunning. I mean, I, can't, I just can't even believe it. And again, a perfect shed. That tells me that she's happy. She's uh, The humidity is right. Like I said, I'm gonna hook up a sprayer on this cage. We've been manually spraying her every day, but wow, that is awesome. Obviously, Burmese pythons have been something that I've loved my whole life. Snazzy here is again coming out of shed, much like Marshmallow, but uh, they're amazing. I mean, they really are incredibly great animals. Uh, you know, I love all snakes, but there's always been this soft spot for me for Burmese, probably because it was my first snake that I had forever and it was really kind of the animal that really launched BHB breeding albino Burmese python back in the day when I was like 18 years old and uh, I don't know I love them I think that they're amazing and if you have the ability to keep a big snake uh, don't ever overlook Burmese pythons because these guys are wonderful. Now that we've covered all the things that make Burmese pythons amazing animals and what can be a great pet, let's go ahead and talk about the things why they might not be right for you or really right for a lot of people for that matter. First off, they need a huge cage, right? This is actually an eight foot by six foot cage. That's a lot of room. Now you could probably keep it in a little smaller cage, but really that's about the size you want for a relatively large snake, right? So you have to have not only a lot of space, but it also costs a lot of money to heat and operate a large enclosure like this. We all know now that Snaz is back on food that he's been crushing frozen rabbits. Well, that is definitely a problem, right? In the sense that you can't go to your local pet shop typically and buy frozen rabbits so getting food for these guys is a little bit more difficult you've got to find the right food source and be able to supply them because you know snaz could eat large rats frozen rats and be fine but when they get bigger bigger they really do need frozen rabbits or little pigs or something like that so the food source is more difficult and oftentimes a little more expensive not to mention uh you don't want to see a poop from an 18 foot python trust me uh i have dealt with it my whole life and i'm here to tell you it's not the most pleasant thing so they can be a little bit messy and uh, a little bit of a challenge to clean when they decide to pass that frozen rabbit or pig need your help a little bit guys i have just one enclosure pretty much left that i don't know what to put in i've been just kind of grinding thinking this is that enclosure right here you can kind of get the idea it's actually six foot by four foot by about four foot high right here just to give you an idea it's got that nice ledge over there obviously we can put basking spots wherever we want we do have a heat pad in the corner over there and i'm just not sure this cage just hasn't talked to me i tell people all the time it's like the cages talk to me a little bit i know that sounds weird but they I think like that would be cool for that enclosure but this one I've been struggling with you know I don't know what exactly to put in here so I figured I'd ask your guys' help and, and maybe you'll come up with something really cool that over the next few weeks whatever however long we're closed we could maybe acquire that animal and get it kind of settled in and habituated to this enclosure so let me know in the comments what you think I should put in this habitat and obviously these guys get big you know sunrise is only half grown just about 10 foot these guys can get 18 foot and she's again only about 50 pounds i've seen these guys up to 150 plus pounds so it's a big snake to handle and by the way we have a policy here we don't handle large snakes without a second person if you're ever thinking about getting a big snake i think you should adhere to that as well meaning that if you have a pet snake like a burmese python you should probably have two people which is another little bit of a bummer and by the way with that being said i'm going to do a scale on scale here so 10 being the best possible pet reptile i hate to say it guys but as much as i love burmese pythons i'm going to give them a solid three that's right a three not because i don't think they're great animals just i don't think they're a practical pet for most people let me know in the comments if you agree with me or what you would rate these guys on a scale to scale basis i mean maybe i'm a little low i'm not sure but uh also let me know again what other animals you want me to do if you think this is a cool idea while we're on lockdown we could do this uh maybe once or twice a week i don't know so anyways uh that is it for burby's pythons so this is what they call uh optimism at its best That's right. because amidst all this craziness and us being shut down Lori's still stocking the gift shop you know so that's great <laughs> uh, so we just got a new shipment in and guess what this was back ordered last time how cool uh, is that is that awesome or what so this is so cute Lori oh my god i wish people yeah. could come and actually buy it i know Look right? at the eyes man well, the eyes are beautiful soon soon 
know, it's so this awesome. Is good. So, so yeah. again, uh, here at the Reptarium, we're still pushing ahead forward, and obviously Lori is so optimistic that she's uh, she's buying stuff for the gift yeah, shop. So, look at, oh, look my, oh my gosh, that is, oh my <laughs> god, that is so. Oh People my god, people love these so much. I had to get a few other options. Oh my gosh, and uh, I, I'm gonna start talking about optimistic things right now. Oh. We're gonna do another big like reopening party uh, when this uh, whole thing is over. So hopefully you guys can come visit us when you feel comfortable being out in yeah, public. So but uh, uh, oh gosh, I didn't see we'll see turtle. Yeah. Oh my god, that is dope. So uh, we'll we'll make announcements as things kind of get through. But as you can see, we're pushing forward here. Uh, this will pass, guys. We're gonna get through this. As we're wrapping up the breeding season with ball pythons, and what I mean by that is that we have most of our females are already close to ovulation or ovulated, but we still have a bunch of females that are right on that cusp that we're still breeding. Uh, things are going well. I'm going to go ahead and hit an ultrasound really quick just to see how that's going, right? So I ultrasound it about a week and a half ago. If we see really advanced follicles in the animals that were, say, 15 to 20 millimeters, uh, that will kind of put us over the edge there. I think we literally have maybe two or three weeks left of breeding, and then we'll have our stragglers. But for the most part, the breeding season will be done, and then egg season is coming. I think our first clutch is probably a week, maybe 10 days away. Uh, that's exciting. This is a beautiful snake here. This is actually a killer bee bamboo. The bamboo stuff is really cool. And again, she was at 25 millimeters the last time we checked, which is only a week or 10 days ago. Uh, again, everything is growing already. I've only ultrasounded a couple animals. She's at 33 millimeters. So again, maybe one more breeding and she'll be done. Cause they'll ovulate at about, you know, about 40 to 45 millimeters, right that range. But usually if you get one breeding in at 30 to 35, uh, they'll ovulate within a week or something like that. So I usually shelve them. So although this isn't a really big girl, it looks like she's got a bunch of eggs brewing. It's not surprising when an animal is at 18 or 20 millimeters to grow to 25 to 30 millimeters in a week because they really explode at that point. An animal like this, which is actually a Mojave Bongo, that's het for ghosts, was only at 10 millimeters. So we're gonna see if we see any growth in these guys because if we're starting to see growth there, there's still even hope. Now, it didn't grow much, but I do think there's a little bit of growth here. I'm just gonna do a quick measure. Again, it was at 10, it's at 12 now. So again, not much. The growth from 10 to 20 is really slow. Maybe Maybe two to three millimeters per week. Once they hit 20, then they can explode 10 millimeters plus in seven or 10 days. So uh, I don't know if I'll continue breeding this girl or not. She just was bred a couple days ago. So I'll give her a few weeks and I'll decide if I'm gonna breed her again. Because with this slow growth, she's probably not gonna have eggs until August or September. So sometimes I'll just kind of let a female go for the year and wait till next year, get a little more size to her. But uh, hey, we're still seeing growth even in the smaller follicle females. This one's gonna be interesting. This is actually a pastel leopard clown being bred to a banana clown. It was only at 14 millimeters. For whatever reason, this one was kind of lagging behind, as well as one other clown female I have. So I'm hoping that she'll actually have grown this week. Again, she was at 14. I don't see a lot of growth, to be honest with you. It's probably about the same, but she just was bred yesterday, and sometimes copulation can really uh, cause a female to kind of explode afterwards. So she's at 15 millimeters, so only one millimeter. But again, this size, I'm not that worried about it. I'm hoping that maybe in the next two weeks, I'll see it go from 14 to 20 millimeters millimeters and then really explode but I mean she is a gorgeous animal and that clutch would be ridiculous. Just finished ultrasounding and I'm gonna be unbelievably transparent with you guys. I typically don't share a lot of numbers, but it looks like we have 161 females that are past the point that have already ovulated or are in advanced follicle growth where I think they're gonna go. Now there's a chance a couple of them could fall out. We also have about maybe 15 or 20 females that could go or might not go. So it looks like we'll probably be right in that 160 to 170 clutches this year, which is crazy because last year we did 130 clutches. Mary did a great job down here. I've been excited to be in the tail 
tail end so I can really button it up and really push some of these females over that limit so that we can really go well. So uh, there you guys go. Uh, unbelievably, potentially successful year. But you gotta remember, one thing I've learned, you never count your eggs until they're laid and until they hatch. So anything can go wrong. So fingers crossed, it'll turn out to be amazing. And remember guys, we're gonna get through this together. We will do everything we possibly can. Doing a daily Instagram Live, another distraction. You can follow me over at Snake Bites TV. You can also listen to my podcast. I mean, that's a couple hours twice a week. Uh, it's called Checking In. You can subscribe to that right over here. Right over here, you can run through a playlist. That'll keep you busy for about two years or so. And over here, you can actually subscribe to the vlog channel. Turn the post notifications on. I appreciate you guys. Have the best day you possibly can. And I promise, I'll see you guys tomorrow.